Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. We're broadcasting live and glad you're here with us. We're down in the Dolph Simons Family Studio and delighted to be with you on this day. I am joined, of course, by Hawkeye, our faithful uh, medical director for infection prevention and control and infectious disease physician extraordinaire here at KU. We also are joined by two great folks, who we're going to turn to them in just a moment after we get the numbers and see if there are media questions. Joining us today are Janelle Friesen, the PIO for the United Government Public Health Department, and Mariana ramirez Mantilla. I know I didn't say that right. You're going to say it right for me in just a moment. The director of the Junta Center for Advancing Latino Health here at KU Medical Center. They both got an update in Wyandotte County. But first, Hawk. Hi. How are we today? Yeah, I mean, they could always be better. They could always they be could better, about the same, but October's been a bad month for for, yeah. for, for, for the number of deaths. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to start with the number of active patients, we have 30 in the hospital right now, nine of those in the ICU, but six of those on the ventilator. We do have 30 that are still considered um, in that recovery period, so still here in the hospital that really shouldn't be. Um, in Hayes, there are 16 patients, 13 active, and three in that recovery period. But just as you talked about the deaths, um, the deaths are really concerning. And we know that hospitalizations lag behind cases, and we know deaths lag behind hospitalizations. We know that we have better um, algorithms for therapies, and that our um, in-hospital mortality rate has decreased. But I think for the pure number, um, the, we've had 20 deaths already in October, and that is the most deaths of any month since the pandemic of in-hospital patients. So that is really concerning. Again, it's not just numbers, it's, it's, it's loved ones and friends, and um, we're not even through October yet, but, but that should be really concerning to people. Yeah, that's tough. That just gives you one more reason not to get this. And we were on the chief medical officer call just a little while ago, and one of our places, uh, um, uh, one of the uh, hospitals that participated in that had noted they've even had deaths of young people, 23 and 29 year olds. So that's tough. And, and I think it just goes on to point out that this is, is a disease of old and young. There's a report this morning looking at a study from Wisconsin in which now nursing home deaths are up in a county that's or an area that started with a college outbreak. Mm -hmm. um, and then that just moves to the community, which is exactly what our fear has been. Yeah. And I think when you put frontline healthcare workers and essential workers and people who have to work, often from a minority background, um, that you're setting people up. And, and uh, we really, we just have to be thoughtful. And what we need is for everybody to follow those pillars of infection control. I'm sure you, that's the first time you've ever heard us say that. And I think, yeah, on a personal level, you know, I talked to my father yesterday, my 97-year-old grandmother's in a facility um, up in Illinois, and they've had a couple residents now positive. They've had a couple workers, though, that are positive as well to, uh, you know, probably as the initial people who are getting it out in the community who are otherwise young and healthy. And the problem is not necessarily the young and healthy people because, again, 80 85 percent of people will never have to seek medical care. If you're younger, your risk of seeking medical care is even lower. It's unfortunate because it's the people that you can spread it to that are highly vulnerable for complications that can, um, when they get it, it's, that's really dangerous. Yeah, so, all right. Well, let's hear first are there questions from the media this morning. We do have two this morning so far. Uh, Channel 9 would like to know what the doctors think about the latest report from the CDC regarding what close contact means yeah. and how should we adjust how we interact, if at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Danny, you and I were just talking mm -hmm. about that. That just came yeah. out. Why don't you go ahead and review what those changes are? Yeah, so the biggest change, and this is stems from a uh, MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is a CDC publication, um, that stems from a prison guard or two prison guards that had gotten COVID-19. Uh, they did not have any close contact for somebody for 15 minutes at one continual time. What they found was there was multiple small interactions. I think it was... Um, 17 minutes out of 22 interactions that really prompted this. And so because of that, they have changed their guidance from just 15 minutes of close contact, again, that's within six feet, to now um, an additive or cumulative time of 15 minutes of close contact of six feet or less. Um, I, I think it is difficult because we have seen that guidance has changed, but this has changed as the data has changed. And it's all to make the public safer. So as we learn more, we will be able to update our guidance, um, and this is what the CDC is doing. I think it's important for people to understand, don't get too bogged down um, in the 
black and white wording, but it's more of the concept. And Dr. Burke said this when she was on too. This was about the masking. Mask when you go in, mask when you're in these certain situations, which she said was just have a mask on. And so I think it's really important for the public to understand understand the concept and it is a cumulative time amount of 15 minutes with somebody who possibly could be infected or you don't know you're infected the things to understand in these concepts is masking is going to help masking of both parties staying six feet or eight feet or ten feet or more is going to be much better and reducing your interaction with those people as much as possible with other people as much as possible is going to help obviously if you're getting your teeth cleaned or you're getting your haircut that's going to be difficult but in other ways just understand the concept of closeness of um, physical distancing and masking. And the reality is that it doesn't really change our behaviors because if you follow the pillars, right. you're gonna follow those pillars and if you're gonna wear a mask, that time frame drops dramatically. And, yeah. Or, or actually increases dramatically. And then there's also the question of over what period of time? Is it a day, yeah. is it 20? And it's harder to define that because a lot of it depends on the intensity of the amount of virus somebody's shedding That's at exactly the time. Right. Yeah. You know, if they're toward the end, they're not shedding as much virus, that's a much different statement than, you know, really when they're even before they're symptomatic because that's when they shed the most virus. Yeah, that's exactly right. I would agree with you. You know, from I think from the, some of the mouse models, we understand that it takes only a few hundred uh, viral particles to create an infection. And so if you're in an area and you go through uh, somebody's cloud and they're, they're breathing droplets and you inhale that, um, there's no telling how long it takes for those uh, virus particles to either, uh, you know, denature once you've inhaled them or cause infection. Because we understand it is a relatively small amount of virus that can cause infection. So far, there are other studies undergoing right now. But, but to your point, it doesn't take very much. And so it's the cumulative issue. And is it over a day? Is it over 48 hours? It's hard to tell. There wasn't a lot of guidance there. We would st start to say by at least probably a day to, to be safe. Okay. okay and then uh, Channel 5 has a question. Um, they've asked it before but they want to know if you would please answer again and the question is there's a lot of these uh, chain big chain drug stores that are offering these drive up tests where you do it yourself mm -hmm. and then they're going to text you the results in 20 to 40 minutes mm -hmm. and they want to know how efficient and how reliable accurate. those tests are. You know, I think one of the things we should do is get Rachel Eastman back on our program. And I just wrote her us. yesterday. I saw that. <laughs> we'll get her back to help us answer that question. But, Hawk, I think it's all a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no question that the PCR nasal swab is the gold standard. Uh, on the other hand, the tests that these drive through people are off, or the drive through clinics are offering are better, but they don't have the same specificity. And if you're negative, it doesn't necessarily mean the same. It's interesting, uh, Viracor, which is the lab here in Lee Summit, mm -hmm. just got an EUA, I believe, yesterday, um, based upon a study from the University of Washington, or Washington U in St. Louis, I think, that uh, compared their results to yeah. nasal swab. And in that one, it's a home testing kit yeah. that you yeah. do, you mail in, and they promise that once they get it, a 24 hour turnaround with an email to you. So the turnaround overall is going to be three or four days. Yeah. But the, um, uh, they're saying it's about 93% or so, I think, con con uh, compared to the PCR, which is good. It's still mm -hmm. not perfect, and a lot of uh, uh, potential user error, I think. In there. I, I think you're right. I, a user error is my, um, my largest concern here. Um, you know, follow the instructions correctly. Make sure you obtain a good sample. That is going to be very important. Um, so I think moving forward, these antigen tests hopefully will be um, more accessible for people. And one of the theories is that, well, if it's negative and you truly do have it, if it's a false negative, well, that's because you're not shedding enough virus to be infectious. Yeah, we well, don't know that, that to be shoot. Yeah. That is a theory. Um, it is backed by a lot of people. But I think that theory could be more supported if we're certain you're getting an adequate sample and you're doing the sample collection in your anterior uh, nasal passages just as it is instructed to do. Yeah, so I think we don't know a lot about some of those in, in general. I would just caution you that, that it, it, there, there is a potential for false negatives. It's much higher than what we do with the nasal swab today. I do think this technology is getting a lot better, mm -hmm. though, and I'm yeah. going to bet in three to six months this is going to be. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope, cross my fingers, yeah. it's just Steve Stites hoping I have no medical data mm -hmm. behind this, that we have home tests to get you don't have to mail in. Yeah. We'll see. Absolutely. Hey, let's turn to our guests. Let's start first. Janelle Friesen, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the United Government uh, Public Health Department. 
Thank you. Good morning. I'm, I guess I'm Janelle Friesen. I'm the public information officer with the Unified Government Public Health Department. Uh, at first, I want to say some of you may have been expecting Julianne Van Leeu, the director of our health department, who was originally scheduled to be here today. Unfortunately, she got pulled into another health department matter, so she's not able to join us. But she was really glad to be here when she was here last time, and she's absolutely happen, happy to join you all again in the future. Um, I'm going to talk today about a few updates on COVID-19 data for Wyandotte County, some information and updates on testing and flu shots, and some COVID-19 recommendations as you plan your Halloween celebrations and voting. Uh, so my first slide gives uh, one graph about data in our area. I don't have graphs of everything I'm going to mention just because that could um, take up a lot of our time today, uh, but I wanted to call out a little bit. Um, I will mention that our total confirmed cases now are at 7,918, and uh, we've heard some mention of deaths, and right now at Wyandotte County, we're unfortunately up to 158 deaths. Um, the graph I have here shows our rolling average of positive cases. So this is how many new cases we're having confirmed each day on average. So we're obviously not at the peak where we were at back in July when we were having quite the influx of cases. Um, and we have seen a slight dip the last week or so, but overall things are looking like they might be creeping up a bit. So we've, we're at about 40 new cases a day right now. Um, we have been hovering around 40 something for this month. And if you compare to say last month, we were looking at closer to 30 new cases a day. So um, that is a, a little bit of an increase. So we wanna keep an eye on that. That could be indicative of some increase in community spread. Um, we're also seeing with our percent positivity, it had been hovering around 14 or 15 percent um, for that seven day rolling average. And now that has gone up a little bit. We're at 16.9 percent now. So that's another thing we want to keep an eye on. Um, and I know something that has come up in the past um, on here is talking about health disparities with COVID-19 data. And we still definitely see those disparities. Um, we see much higher case rates among Hispanic and Latino residents, for instance, and we see still do see higher death rates among black and African-American residents. Um, I have put a link on here. If you want to find more COVID-19 data, you can go to our website, wicokck.org slash COVID-19 and click on the button that says COVID Hub. Um, and that's going to show you um, all of the most recent data for Wyandotte County and it broken down into different charts and maps um, that can help you dig into that more if you're interested. But let's go ahead and move on to my next slide because I know that we have some other things to get through today. I wanted to make sure I talked about, in case you hadn't heard yet, we have have moved our COVID-19 testing site. Uh, we'd previously been doing testing in our parking lot at the health department, but now we are at 78th and State at the former Kmart location. And uh, that launched on Monday of this week and it's going well so far. We're really happy to have this new site because this allows us to get a higher volume through. We can get more people through to get tested at once. Um, this is also gonna work significantly better as we go into um, the winter months because we have a large temperature controlled socially distanced indoor space that we can use. Um, so if it's 10 degrees outside or there's snow on the grounds that we can still offer this service to our community members. Um, and by moving the site, that also helps at the health department uh, because some of our clinical services that we normally offer, we had had to reduce significantly in order to accommodate the testing being done at our site. So by moving it, we're um, now able to start ramping up so that we'll be able to uh, begin increasing those hours and having more appointment slots available. So we will be putting out more information about updated clinic hours as that gets ramped back up. Um, I also wanted to note um, before we, I'll move on to the Halloween and voting bit in a minute, but I wanted to mention that we will be adding flu shots to our testing site as well. That hasn't launched yet, but in the next couple of weeks, um, we will be uh, adding free flu shots. There's a whole separate section of our building uh, where we will be having that available. And okay, so now I'll go ahead and talk about Halloween and voting. So uh, we know people are looking to figure out how they're gonna celebrate Halloween, but stay safe. So uh, we have developed some guidance to, to help people through that. Uh, the safest ways to celebrate are things like, of course, if there are virtual celebrations, you could have a virtual costume contest. Um, there are community events as well that are drive-through events where you're gonna stay in your vehicle, but they might be handing out, there might be 
treats or there might be a Halloween movie. Uh, but if you are going to do something like going out trick or treating or to a trunk or treat event that has more risk associated with it, we definitely um, urge people to use some precautions to make those activities safer. So of course, wearing masks, not the costume kind, the uh, COVID kind, and then um, keeping that six feet of distance between um, your uh, family or the people in your household and other people who are out trick-or-treating. Um, if you're handing out candy, you can do things like having it bundled up and maybe spaced out um, in front of your rabbit, keeping that distance both between you and the trick-or-treaters and the people who are um, out and about. And so there are other ways you can get creative to, to still enjoy the holiday, but um, make things safer. And we definitely want to talk about COVID safety and voting. Um, we, of course, want everyone to be able to exercise their right to vote, um, but that looks a little different this year in the midst of COVID. Uh, but we, we certainly urge people to vote early. Um, and there are a couple different ways you can do that. There's still time to request um, a mail-in ballot. Uh, you can request one um, if you get that request into the election office by October 27th. And then you have to fill out, sign, and submit that ballot um, by 7 p.m. on election day. And you can mail that in or um, you can drop it off at the election office or they're, they're getting ready to install some additional drop boxes as well. Um, and then there are early voting locations where you can vote in person and those any um, voting location, you know, whether it's your regular polling place for election day or the early voting um, is going to be set up for social distancing, having hand sanitizer available, you know, of course, you need to wear your mask. Um, and you definitely can vote on election day, but just remember, things can come up unexpectedly. And in the world of COVID, it's possible you could get exposed to COVID or, or become sick. And then you might actually be in quarantine or isolation on election day. So all the more reason to, to just go ahead and vote now. So you make sure you're, that your vote is counted. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I can wrap it up there and hand it back off. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for the helpful update. Waco has done a great job on the public health aspects of this, especially because uh, Wyandotte County is just a more challenging population given the um, economics and given the minority and given the number of essential workers that are coming out of Wyandotte County. So it's just, you know, it's a tougher, it's a little harder place. And I think folks have done a great job. Let me turn to Mariana Ramirez. And am I going to say this last name correctly, Montilla? How close am I? Really close. All right, let me hear you say it. Mantilla. Okay, say the whole, your whole name. Okay. Mariana Ramirez Mantilla. Yeah, I wasn't close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mariana, talk to us a little bit about what you do here with you, Tos, and, and uh, the things that you think are really important, um, especially for advancing Latino health. Yeah, and, and thank you so much for the invite. Uh, so I'm Mariana Ramirez Mantilla, and I'm the director of the Juntos, that stands for Together in Spanish. Juntos Center for Advancing Latino Health. And one of our main goals is to be uh, uh, a, a link with the Latino community to create academic and research partnership and make sure that all the opportunities, the service opportunities, the research opportunities at our university are available to our Latino communities. So we have been working closely with the health department for the past six, seven months. Um, involved in an effort through the Health Equity Task Force. Uh, so I would like to talk about that, the Health Equity Task Force. And then we have also been working closely with um, a group of community leaders called the um, Ministerio de Salud, Health Ministry. And that's uh, that has presence in both Johnson and Wyandotte counties. And lastly, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about our Juntos Radio, which is a Spanish-based uh, health podcast. And we have had the opportunity to interview uh, several health professionals and, and clinicians from, from our university. Um, so the Health Equity Task Force, and I don't know, uh, Jill, if we have slides to share, if not that. We okay. don't have that with that. We do have one about some excess deaths. We're going to get to that after you're done. Perfect. Okay. So the Health Equity Task Force uh, is really a, a group of community-based organizations and leaders that um, got together really early in March when uh, we had the first death in the by COVID in the African American community. And um, the, the first thing that we were looking at was the access to testing. Back then it was very limited and, and only really 
people that belong to certain clubs had access to it. And with that, I mean people who had a primary care physician or were part of a healthcare system, but there wasn't something really available for community members who might be uninsured, for example. Uh, so we, um, with that goal, we started partnering with closely with the health department. The leadership at the health department has been amazing in Wyandotte County. Uh, Julian, Allen, Greiner, they, they have been amazing to partner with. And then there's a bunch of organizations, including NBCC Corporation, um, Vibrant Health, SOAP, uh, and, and many others, who, the Community Health Council, who have been working really uh, diligently to bring testing available to several communities. Uh, so we have subgroups within the task force, and one of them is focused on testing. And what we do is we looked at the areas with highest incidence of, of COVID and then look at the uh, neighborhoods that are most accessible to um, the communities that have been hit the, the hardest and then develop partnerships with partners that are willing to host a testing site, who are willing to promote it within their networks and really work with us throughout the process. So today we have tested over 4,000 people through the pop-up testing, and this is work done at churches, community centers, public libraries, um, schools, and uh, the demographics are, are really, they, they really reflect um, the, our, our goal, the minority populations that we want to target there. Uh, Latinx and, and African Americans and also refugees are, are well represented in the people who are being tested. And the positive rates uh, have been as high as 40% at those events. So we're, we're happy that we're able to uh, provide that service to community members so that they can um, take, take action. Like lately at the pop-up test, the testing rates have been uh, lower than they were before the past four weeks. And we're really seeing this lack of um, support for those who test positive and don't have, for example, access to paid uh, sick leave, right? In, the, in our community, we have our Latino community is heavily represented in, in the service sector, like construction workers, uh, service, food, Food, uh, food industry and custodians. And many of these jobs keep our economy running, but they don't have access to um, healthcare benefits or health insurance or, or paid sick leave. So when you are balancing out either potentially getting tested and getting a positive result and not being able to work for 14 days, versus if you're asymptomatic not being tested and still be able to work and bring the money that you bring to your family, then that's the obvious choice, right? Uh, so we are working to identify resources in, in the community and we have several organizations who are doing a great job. For example, El Centro has access to United Way funding to uh, assist with rental and utilities. Uh, but that's not enough. We really need some something comprehensive. Um, so that, that's the, the status of, of the pop-up testing. And I, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So, you know, we have a slide I think we ought to take a look at. Um, it notes that from late January to early October 2020, the United States had 299,000 more deaths than the typical number during the same period in prior years. Two out of three of those deaths were due from COVID-19, and the largest percentage increases above baseline were among those who are Hispanic and Latino and adults aged 25 to 44. That's tough. That's the CDC released that information. And I think what it demonstrates is that this is a population, just as our two guests have focused on, that has special challenges. And a lot of it has to do with having to work and having to go out and earn a living and then coming back and being in a, in a living situation where there may be a multi-generational family, all of which translates to more disease spread, yeah. Hawk. Yeah, absolutely. And we have anecdotal experience with that here. We've seen a number of of our patients up in the ICU who fit that demographic perfectly. And, um, you know, it, it continues to need to be said, uh, the economic um, 
hardships and ethnic minorities are, continue to be hit harder and harder compared to uh, their, count, uh, their counterparts around the community. Well, in this I believe we are in this together and we're only mm -hmm. going to get out of it together. And what we have to do is work together to try and make sure we address the health needs of everyone yep. here. And I think when, when you start putting essential workers at risk and, and the people who have to do work at a grocery store, yep. or for, you know, the frontline health care workers or first responders, those folks are very vulnerable. And when that vulnerability is exposed through COVID-19, then we're all going to struggle a little yeah. bit. And, and, and that, that we should all be concerned, especially with this rise. Jill, let's turn and see what questions we have out there today. I first want to say uh, people like Shalene, who is writing, is, is she agrees with Mariana mm -hmm. and is talking about it being just such a huge part of the solution to controlling the virus by mm -hmm. helping the families who, who have to stay home, but they got yeah. kids to feed. Right. So That's, it's she's, tough. And so yeah. people go ahead and get out. They have to go to work. And I mean, I, I you know, we see that, as you said, Hawk, in our, in our hospital we deal with, with, that, with yeah. uh, our patients who are here. Uh, I take care of a lot of patients. I, those people feel the need to, to work. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people don't always, you know, they may, they may have to work through their symptoms. And that's tough because then they expose other people. Maurice wants to know, does uh, Wyandotte County test children for COVID that are under age six? Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Does Wyandotte County test folks who are under six, Janelle? Yes, um, we do not have um, a, a minimum age. We, we can test, we have tested infants before at our site. So yes, we do test um, young children at our testing site. There just needs to be a parent or guardian with them, of course. Um, and our, our staff are, um, I, there was a great story that I, I heard from one of our, our partners who said that they brought um, that they knew someone who brought a child in and, and the uh, the staff member who helped them was like, I'm going to steal your boogers. And so they, they tried to make it comfortable for them as they came through. So, uh, yes, um, if you need to get your child tested, you can come to our site. Here's my question, yeah. can I get this? Is the swab for young kids, is it smaller than it is for adults? And if so, can I use that next time? <laughs> I, don't really I am not sure. That. It's probably the same size. Okay, we're going to find this out. I don't know the answer. Hawkeye Rachel doesn't would know, know the answer. answer. Okay, we're going to find out. We're going to let you but know tomorrow. I'll Is the swab the different for young children? No, you can't get that if you're old. I'm sure that's the right. answer. <laughs> but some of us have a really big nose, so we don't need a small swab. Okay. And Brian, I'm going to try to make this more succinct, but he said Rex Archer, which I believe is the... Jackson County, County Public Health, yeah, uh, public health Director was saying yeah. that until someone proves to him that children really get it and spread it, that gating criteria for school should be if you have enough teachers to teach. He okay. said that, mm -hmm. that um, he goes on to compare it to a hurricane, says it's Hurricane One. Brian wants to know, mm -hmm. um, do kids get it? Do we need to worry about it? Are we testing? Well, Do we need to be the, testing Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids? So there's all this yeah. data initially, Hawkeye, about yeah. the kids really get it. And I'm going to turn to our guests and see what the community uh, yeah. here in Wyandotte is thinking, too. Have. But, but you know, initially, we even said, and we had some folks who were from Children's Mercy, yeah. and we probably ought to grab our Children's Mercy colleagues again in the near future and let's have a conversation about what's going on with kids. But um, and, and Dr. Lauer here. But I think that we used to say that, uh, gosh, kids, A, don't really get it, and B, they don't spread mm -hmm. it enough, and all that's now, all that's not true anymore, right? Because that what yeah. we're seeing is that actually children do get it. Yeah. They don't usually get as sick as adults, but they can spread it. Yeah, I think that initial data was um, indirect evidence or incidental findings based. Uh, I think there were a lot of confounding factors to those studies, including huge shutdowns where schools were stopped, people were at home, groups of young people were not getting together at that period of time. We have molecular evidence that you have uh, similar viral titers, meaning the amount of virus in your upper respiratory tract as a child um, compared to an adult, so similar. We know they can spread it. We've seen, and we've seen the last few weeks or last month, the largest people, the largest amount of people that are getting it are kids ages 10 to, to 20. So we know that they can spread it. Um, I don't think there's a lot of debate around that. We know that in that young population, it is uh, it has been going around. That's the largest population uh, that has increased in cases. So yeah, and I think you know, if you get really young, the breath cloud is probably not as great. And so that may be a, a part right. of it. But but I, I yeah, I don't think there's really any question anymore. And, and which would be true for any other coronavirus. So let's ask any of our guests, what is your all sense? What's the community thinking here in Wyandotte about young children? So Wyandotte's been pretty restrictive about young kids going back to school. 
Um, yes, we, we have some restrictions in place and there are additional um, restrictions and guidelines depending on what school district you're in. Um, and, and we are keeping an eye on cases in schools. We actually have a map of school related cases on our COVID hub. Um, we have seen some um, cases in outbreaks tied to schools. There, there was one um, elementary school in our area that uh, we worked with them to temporarily move them to virtual learning um, after they had a large number of exposures within the school school. Um, they're, they're back to in-person learning now, but uh, our epidemiology team work very closely with school nurses um, as they're dealing with this and, and figuring out day to day what happens if someone shows up to the nurse's office with symptoms. Um, we're working to, um, to to see what we can do to get testing supplies for school nurses so they can do testing um, at the school. Uh, and we are um, continuing to monitor that and uh, our health department leadership is in regular communication with school superintendents. In regards to numbers, you can also see an age breakdown of um, COVID-19 cases on our COVID hub. And um, you actually see more cases among 10 to 19 year olds than you do among 70 year olds. So uh, it, it is, uh, the numbers are higher than you would think um, when you look at that age breakdown. Yeah, so Mariana, do you, do you have children or I don't know, did, 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 are you involved with that in the Latino community? I do have children and I know it is a concern. So uh, family is a huge value for our Latino families. So respect for our elders and, and protecting our children, those, those are really important things. Uh, and with many of our families living in multi-generational homes where you have grandkids taking care of their grandparents, that is a concern that if, if the children can get it, then they can also uh, spread it in the home. And when you have grandparents at home, that is a big concern. Yeah, so that is something I think we don't yeah. wrestle with. It's something we have to watch. So yeah. I do think kids can help spread it. I think we're seeing that effect uh, mm -hmm. in communities throughout the country now. All right, so Susie and Donnie have clarifying questions. Susie wants to know, yesterday you said something about that if you get a positive test for COVID, it doesn't mean you're positive for COVID. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so let's clarify that. So. Um, if you, you can be tested and have SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes mm -hmm. COVID-19. If you're asymptomatic and you're not ill, you don't technically have COVID-19, you have the virus. Is, right. And so I think that's the difference. And at that point, you would be an asymptomatic carrier of SARS-CoV-2. Um, knowing what's asymptomatic and what's symptomatic is a very fine line, yes. though. It's kind of a gray zone. So we, yeah. we, we try to stay away from this distinction. but. Just think about it as SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. And if you get sick from SARS-CoV-2, you have COVID-19. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, right? that's, yeah, exactly. We tried to be uh, very clear and clarified. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. If you have any symptoms, it is can be difficult, just as you said, a very fine line between what is a symptom or not. You may have a sniffle for a couple days and that's it. That's your only symptom. You may think it's not a symptom. I had a gentleman who was in his early 40s who had a cough less than 24 hours um, and that was his only symptom. So it's very difficult to say if you are truly asymptomatic and this plays out in the literature all the time and they do try to qualify. Um, there was one article that had four different definitions of asymptomatic because it's just difficult for people in a day-to-day -day basis to understand that. COVID-19 is the disease spectrum that is caused by SARS-CoV-2, the virus. The issue with this is if you test positive for the virus, you may not have any symptoms whatsoever, but that does not mean you cannot spread it. And that is the big issue here. And so it is important to stay isolated for that 10 days so that you can hopefully decrease the chance that you're gonna spread it to It's other also people. another reason to wear a mask all the time, right? Absolutely. If you wear a mask, you're not gonna spread the disease nearly as much. I mean, the, the masking makes such a difference. Donnie wants to know, 15 accumulation of minutes in how long? An hour, 24? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have to go through that CDC recommendation yeah. a little bit more. It wasn't completely clear. I was trying to look at that this morning and really couldn't get to the bottom yeah, of that question. I perused it. I couldn't either. Um, I'll take a look at the, the MMW report that they based that change um, and guidance on. Uh, I think initially we're going to start to say 24 hours. 
um, it is very difficult to know because it it's, it's not clear or evident, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And and it also depends on what your other activities are. And did you have a mask on? Not have a mask on? There are a lot of things that are gonna yeah. that are gonna modify that. And uh, it's kind of like the old thing that says with ten minutes, and then in some places it was thirty minutes, and other yeah. places it was five minutes, right. and everybody had this differing view of how long and how. But it also meant how close you are to somebody if you're eight yeah. feet or if you're two feet. I mean, all those things matter in viral transmission, right? People look for this. Give me the black and white standard. Yeah, you know, there's not a black and white standard. There's just really a relative risk. And uh, the best thing we can tell you is that if you have a mask on, the person that you're around have a mask on, and you're more than six feet away, you're not going to get it. And it's all these concepts of just understanding these things. Because we know that in uh, a, a spin class that was in the media, that everything was done correctly according to the health department, but people got it, and it spread. But we know our one of our, our, our favorite guests and patient, Anil, he was sitting next to somebody on the couch, and they did not get it. So it's just these concepts to understand. Nothing is uh, complete 100% black and white. It's all levels of risk and risk mitigation. And the way you handle it is to stay six feet apart yeah. and wear a mask. Yep. Yeah. All right, so Neil wants to know uh, runners that run in a line, there's about mm -hmm. six of them, and bicyclists that bicycle in a line, mm -hmm. now with the new study, mm -hmm. is the person who's two, three, mm -hmm. four, five yeah. running through everybody's breath cloud? Yeah. You know, where where great, do you want to be it, in the it, line? It's a great question. It's all yeah. about if you're outside or inside on Absolutely. that. Because the inside outside dynamic changes everything. Um, and where you want to be is more than 10 feet apart if you're exercising and for probably further apart and outside. And if you can do that, I think you're a lot better off. I think, you know, if you're in a high school track meet and there's a bunch of kids all running in a pack, well, you know, that's a little different, um, even though you're outside. So I think the key is the same thing we always say. You, you just have to determine what's your level of risk you're willing to accept. And clearly being outside is better than being inside. The wind currents and dispersion of the virus makes a huge difference if you're outside. Second of all, um, trying to stay more, I think when exercising, staying more than 10 feet apart because people are breathing harder and they're going to expel more of a viral load. And then third, uh, try to do that on a windy day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I don't know really about that. Third, you're going to be running through um, breath clouds. What is the chance you're going to inhale certain droplets? While you're running through that, you're moving. There is turbulent flow with the wind. I think it's and, and less. By the way, risky. you're passing through the air creates turbulence on your own. Right. So you've already created a stream. Yeah. And technically, what normally happens, if you think about biking, the person in front of you creates that stream that kind of goes to the side around you. And so theoretically, the virus ought to go around if you're super close. But yeah. I, I would leave it up to the, the, those who are pro bikers to describe how why they try to tail somebody right. so tightly. But it, I think it's certainly less risky than doing some other activities. Yeah, well. and it's a lot better than being inside doing it. I wouldn't do that. Time for one, one more. One more question, then, we gotta, then we'll be done. Yeah, so Glenn wants to know, how long is an individual contagious? If you get exposed on Monday, do you start being contagious Wednesday and Friday and then remain contagious for 10 days? Great question. Yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. So for the uh, purposes of contact tracing, Initially, the CDC was saying 10 days. That got extremely difficult to do contact tracing. And so quite a while, quite early into the pandemic, it was changed to um, two days prior to symptoms. And this is based on some evidence from very good published reports, um, one of which was in the New England Journal of Medicine, that showed that you have high viral titers, probably at least one, if not two days prior to any symptoms. And then in another report, they showed that the viral titers in your upper respiratory tract do seem to decrease one or two days after symptoms start, and they continue to decrease uh, from there. So by about seven or eight days, your immune system should have kicked in to really dampen down um, any significant amount of viral titer. Um, the viral titer is important because that will cause you to be infectious. And so from that point on, that's why from CDC guidance, they say after 10 days of symptom onset, you can probably get back into society if you are otherwise improved in symptoms and fever free for three days. So we say about 10 days. It's probably more of the seven to eight, eight day range. But if you can stay isolated for 10 days after symptom onset, um, you are probably gonna be less infectious. There may be certain outliers, which is gonna be a small, very small percentage of the people that may be infectious after that, but that's why it is that 10 days of isolation.
All right. Hey, I want to thank our guests today, Janelle and, and Mariana, for um, being a part of our program. And, and I do want to really say thanks to the great work you all have done in Wyandotte County. Wyandotte County is the home to a lot of really important folks who help keep our economy thriving, uh, help keep uh, our, our area going. And, and I really, um, you know, Wyandotte County is actually, it's a cool place. I think mm -hmm. it's one of the most diverse places in Kansas City. And as it turns out, one of the most diverse places, diverse places in the United States. And don't think we give it enough credit. So just so thanks to help keeping our communities healthy. Thanks for doing the great work you're doing. We really appreciate it. Final thoughts from either of you today? Janelle, let's start with you. Sure, and thank you for your kind words. And, and I would just say, um, get your flu shot. It's important every flu season, but it's especially important when we have flu season and COVID happening at the same time. Um, and, you know, both of those drawing on healthcare resources at the same time and similar symptoms. So it's, it, if you haven't already, get that flu shot um, and get tested for COVID-19 if you have any symptoms or if you've been exposed. And even if you're asymptomatic, we now offer asymptomatic testing. So if you'd like to get tested in general, but especially maybe if you're in, in certain uh, jobs where you might be at higher risk or you're going to be maybe seeing someone who you haven't seen in a while and you want to get tested beforehand, then, then please come get tested. And just a, a reminder that we all we all just need to find a balance in our lives right now. We all have things we need to go about in our day-to-day -day lives, but it's a matter of, of, of taking small steps to, to reduce that risk um, uh, and again, find that balance that works for all of us and to protect ourselves, the people around us, um, the people we care about in our community. Indeed. Thank you. And Mariana, final thoughts from you are from the Junto Center for Advanced Latino Health here at KU Med. Thank you again. Um, and early on in the pandemic, the lack of access to COVID information in Spanish was a huge barrier for our community. So we have been working with the health department and community leaders to produce COVID communications in Spanish. And also we have our podcast, Juntos Radio, in Spanish, which is a video podcast. So that's a huge resource that is also available for, for our community. And I'd be happy to leave the information to access the podcast and then also stay tuned for um, COVID communications in Spanish through the health department. Yeah, thank you very much. Hawk, final thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, yesterday I think was a big news day for the CDC. They did update and change a lot of their guidance, including what is a close contact. Really, that should not change for anybody what the large concept is. Continue to stay distanced from people. Continue to wear your mask. They also updated their guidance and, and some of their um, tips for people in the hospitality industry, including hotels and, and things to do and things to ask for. Uh, things for institutes of higher learning, such as colleges, and of course, K through 12 schools, we had the question today about children and can children spread it. Children can spread the disease. We know that in K through 12 schools around our community, a lot of steps have been taken. They have to continue to be taken. Uh, please go to the website and look up the new interim guidance for K through 12 schools. And we understand ch kill, uh, children can spread the disease, but if those systems are in place and you have uh, the people, the adults, doing the right things, wearing the mask as they should um, above their nose and below their chin, not meeting in large groups or meetings. Um, you can help decrease the spread between your teachers and administrators and counselors as well because the children are going to really take cues from you and wear their mask properly. So if you can, everybody can go look up, um, see if, if their particular area is, has been updated in guidance, that will help keep everybody safe as well. Hey, tomorrow, Dr. David Wild and Lance Williamson and Infection Con Prevention and Control join Hawkeye and I to help us answer your questions as we head into the weekend. Still remember to send us those mask photos. Janet sent us this picture of Wolfie, who doesn't mm -hmm. mind wearing a mask. She says everyone in the family takes COVID-19 seriously. Good job, Wolfie. <laughs> Tony says he loves trying to make others smile during COVID-19. He gives these masks as simple gestures to lighten and protect us against COVID-19. Yes, indeed. And I, yeah, that's me down there showing the, 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 the love for Star Trek. He loves giving people a tool and the power to beat the virus. I'll say, Tony, thank you. I love my mask. My son stole that from me because he loves the mask as well. Hey, I got another mask challenge for you. Temperature next week is supposed to have a high of 32 and a minute middle and then drop down to 25 degrees. Here's the challenge. Go outside, take a deep breath, blow out. Put your mask on, do the same thing. Now, tell me. Where's your breath cloud? 
and where does it go when you put a mask on? That's your mask challenge. Check it out. Because when you do that, I think you're going to see that those pillars of infection control we talk about every day are really, really important. And they're still the things that are going to help keep you safe. Okay, one last that last question about this mask picture we've got up there. Who put the Raider sign up there? That's, really? You know, How do we do that? That's one of our favorite the transporters, Steve. Yeah, I you know, know, but we he's gotta, a we Raiders gotta talk guy. To him about we are going to talk to him. And there's Shalitha right. over there on the top left corner, too. Yeah, She's that's great. Steve. Steve, we're, we're here in trouble. We're coming, we're coming after you. Yeah, here we go. All right, remember, there's still no place like home. We'll see you tomorrow.